Oilam, the host, or number one, is perhaps one of my favorite characters in Squid Game. I mean, who am I kidding? They're all my favorite. But with that said, number one is definitely my favorite. I recently decided to do an entire video dedicated to the front man, and people seem to have really liked it. So I thought, hey, why not dedicate an entire video to the host? Basically doing a full in-depth analysis on who the host is, trying to understand his philosophy, and answering some questions about him, as well as giving my theories and debunking some other theories about number one. Oh, by the way, spoilers. In Squid Game, the hierarchy of the organization goes circle guard at the bottom, then triangle, square in the middle, the front man, and then, at the top, it's the host. Back in the day around the year 1988, Oilam got a bunch of his rich clients together and were like, hey, we don't really find any joy because of all of our wealth. So they started Squid Game to have some fun. Quick side note, my favorite detail hinting at number one being the host of the games was how in episode 7 VIPs, you can see his white hair in this shot of him from behind, and you can also see his old man hands when he sets down the owl mask on the table. In episode 9, during the sky building conversation, it seems that the main core of Elam's justification for the games is when he tells Sungihan, no one had to play, and you all put your signatures on the agreement, and that you all made your decision to come back on your own. And oh my goodness, I'm about to ruin your day, Elam. Let's take a hot moment to dissect these overwhelming bad and effectual excuses for running the games. Squid Game was made with Elam's vision, so in order to better understand him, let's ask that one question. I feel like you may know it. Oh boy, here we go. Was Squid Game ethical? Uh, no. Uh, no, it wasn't. The frontman, being a high-level representative of the games, tells the rule-breaking doctor that players suffered from inequality and discrimination in the real world, but in the games, everyone is given an equal opportunity, continuing to claim that the competition is offering each player one last chance to have a fair fight and win. His ideals are clearly an extension of Elam's reasoning, and justification for the games. To be fair, some of this is true. The games at certain points are equal and and fair. That's why number one chooses to vote no during the vote between the players continuing the games or going home. Elam wants to keep the games fair in his mind, so in order to maintain this false sense of moral superiority, his way of making the games fair is that every single player has to agree to participate. So if 50% of players don't want to play, Elam can't force them to play, so the tiebreaker is automatically a vote no. Oh, just look at how disappointed he is after voting, but when talking about this, there's one line of dialogue from the sky building conversation that really sticks with me. When Elam said that you all put your signatures on the agreement. If we're going by the logic that everyone agreed to it because they signed up for it. Oh my acorns, no. Yes, I will admit that the entry process was sketchy, with the whole knocking players unconscious, changing their clothes, and putting them in a mysterious facility in an undisclosed location. But, from the start, the games were incredibly deceptive and misleading. Elam's employees like the salesman, are hired to prey on people who are struggling financially. A lot of them are either criminals, gambling addicts, people harassed by shark loans, those who are just trying to provide for their families, etc. The organization has extensive records on each player, so they were clearly keeping tabs on civilians who were desperate for money. So the salesman casually bumping into Sangihan was no coincidence. Once you take these desperate and broken people and put them into an opportunity to make more money, yeah, they're a little more open to some sketchy stuff. The guards claimed that they reluctantly took drastic measures to maintain confidentiality. Reluctantly. And even claimed they'll return everything once the games are over, implying that all the players will be leaving at some point. The first game the participants played with the salesman was used to prove the legitimacy of their operation and gain the trust of the players. Yet no one died from the first game. On the very vague and brief player consent form, clauses 1 and 2 state that a player is not allowed to stop playing, and if the player refuses to play, they will be eliminated. Typically, uh, when people think of elimination in games, uh, they think I'm out, not oh, a death. 255 people were given a literal fatality in the first game, without knowing they were putting their lives at risk. Over 50% of participants died without knowing exactly what was happening. Out of 201 surviving players, 187 returned, meaning 14 players were able to walk away from this. Statistically speaking, with a re-entrance rate of 93%, a total of around 30-something people would have made it out if they knew what the games truly were. 
were. But then again, those 14 players that did walk away don't start with a clean slate. After getting the info about how many players came back, the frontman tells the supervisor to keep an eye on those who didn't return. Whether or not that means kill them if they start talking, or they'll kill them in general, is really up in the air. It's just safe to assume that they're going to be watched over for the rest of their lives. Then on top of them signing this consent contract that's almost as misleading as signing up for student loans, the guards further hide the fact that the players are going to die by only bringing out one square and eight circles during the introduction. Because after the first game, where it's revealed that the players can die, the circles are then replaced with the triangles, aka the ones with the guns. If the players who died in the first game saw the triangle men with guns, a lot of them would have probably wanted to bail out earlier, or at least be extremely cautious about the games. The guns would easily put anyone on edge, and persuade them to find out more information about what the current situation is. This would have also caused them to start asking the right questions. The re-entrance rate was 93%, but that doesn't help Elam's case in the slightest. It's repeatedly shown to us that life on the outside is as bad, if not worse, than in the games. Which is why the games have such a high return rate. You could make the argument that when the players are finally aware of the situation, and are given a choice to continue playing or to leave and go home, that the rules are finally fair right? Well, 187 players returned after knowing that they will probably die in the games. More people play the games every year because they are left with no other options on the outside. Elam claims that his job is lending out money, so we must own and operate some major banks. Explaining why in episode 9, Sungihan receives a golden card from Elam, with the text on the card telling him to go to the 7th floor of the Sky Building. In real life, the Sky Building is the executive center that's part of the International Finance Center in Yo Oido. During his conversation with Sangihan in episode 2, Oilam claims that the torture in the real world is worse, which is slightly his fault for being one of the super rich bank owning elites. In this scene where Sangihan is getting a haircut, you can hear a news reporter on the TV announce that the country's household debt is currently on the rise. You can also hear the reporter say that the biggest reason for the steep rise in Korea's reported household debt is due to the lifted government restrictions on financial loans. The financial struggle of the citizens isn't from eating too much much avocado toast, it's clearly a result of a broken system. Like always, the big banks that get routinely bailed out by the government will seize this opportunity to squeeze as much money as they possibly can out of everyone. The people running the banks like Elam prey on the working class, driving up these interest rates and ruining a lot of people's lives. Like Sungihan's mother. As she mentioned, she can't pay off the monthly interest rate of Sungihan's loan. Elam is well aware of this corrupt system, and most likely contributed to it as more people sign up for Squid Game every year. Squid Game conveniently started around the time of one of the most historical stock market crashes for the global economy. And if you look at the records from the earlier years versus the more recent years, the list of players in 99 was like a book long. But the 2020 games is literally an entire shelf. One could say that what Elam is doing with the games is no different from Sungi Hunt's lender forcing him to sign one of his kidneys away. The hypocrisy of number one is outstanding. Elam was at times safe and at other times not safe during the games. It's safe to say that Elam did not know what the games were going to be beforehand, because during the second game, he genuinely seemed surprised by what he found in the container. It's something he ended up struggling with too, and needed to steal Sungi Hun's strategy in order to win. Elam did end up putting his life in danger, but does it really matter? Because at the same time, he went against the very principles of the games, as he did have an unfair advantage. You know, the kind of crime he punished other players for. During the red light green light game, number one hung out in the back for the first half. He was not safe from the bullets of death. And if you disagree, I've made an entire video debunking the theory that he was safe during this game. Please go ahead and direct all of your hate or love at that video. Oh look at that, you can see one of the guards wielding the gun. Anyway, Elam knew that he could die, which definitely gave him the advantage in the first round. But when we finally see him move to the front, it was after he had enough time to get a good read on the situation. He later brags about the fact that he got to the finish line quicker than Sungihan, but Sungihan was frozen and still in shock at what was happening. So yeah, that that would delay him a little bit. There's also that moment in the episode of VIPs where it's revealed that number 17 had long-term work experience in glass manufacturing. So he begins examining the refraction of the light and is doing a pretty good job. But in order to make the games more interesting for the VIPs, the frontman cuts the lights, disrupting his strategy and ruining 
being the entire point of a fair and equal game. This would be equivalent to them forcing Sungi Hun to stop licking the honeycomb candy, as all number 17 was doing was using his knowledge. Kind of symbolic of the wealthy saying that we have a fair and equal capitalist system. However, they constantly buy off politicians and lobbyists to make it harder for the working class to advance. But then they'll tell you that you can get where they are with some hard work and a little luck. And on top of all of this, in Sungi Hun's limo ride, not home, the frontman tells Sungi Hun that he bets on horses, and that it's no different in Squid Game, except people are their horses. Even though the most animalistic individuals we see are the ones wearing the animal masks, the VIPs fully dehumanize the players, and exploit them by putting them into a situation they didn't really have a choice of being in. And I know what some of you may be thinking right now, Bryce, did you really make a video just to trash on number one? Well, yeah, but there's more to it. I swear. The director of the series, Huang Dongyao, looks at the series as an allegory about modern capitalist society, so the games themselves are in a sense no different from the outside. Elam claims that he decided to get together and do a bunch of brainstorming with his rich clients. And during Season 1 Episode 7, VIPs, a VIP makes a quick comment claiming that the contest in Korea was the best, most likely implying that the contest in Korea is one of many happening around the world, meaning the international clients Elam brainstormed with, must have liked the idea of Squid Game so much that they all got inspired to start their own versions of Squid Game, meaning there could be other hosts or VIPs running other Squid Game competitions in other countries. Or Elam being the host just owns all the competitions. The title for the show Squid Game is definitely named after the children's game Squid Game, but as we can see on the records of the games, the competition is actually called Squid Game. The design of the guards' masks are even designed after the shapes used in Squid Game. Even even though they don't play Squid Game every year, as returning VIPs were ignorant of the game's existence, as the frontman had to explain to them that it was originally a children's game that was played in Korea many years ago. We open the series with a flashback, and Sungi Han narrating about the last time he felt alive, which was playing Squid Game, saying at that moment, I felt as if I owned the entire world. I felt exhilarated. When Elam is on his deathbed, he reveals to Sungi Han that he formed the games with his rich clients, aka the other hosts or other VIPs, who felt no joy due to their significant wealth. In the sky building conversation, Elam claimed that he had so much fun doing things with his friends during his childhood, implying that he and Sungi Hun must have had similar childhoods, as Squid Game had been a major part of both of their childhoods, which is why Elam designed the guards after it. Elam and Sungi Hun both claimed in episode 6 that the alleyway looked really familiar. They both knew the same kind of marble game, and on top of that, they have a lot of other similarities, raising the question, could Elam be Sungi Hun's dad? They do have a lot in common, including their origins. However, when they were first walking through the recreation of Elam's previous home, Elam talks about how his son and his friends would always play in the room they were standing in. If Sungi Hun was Elam's son, he would have recognized the environment and would have connected the dots with what Elam was saying. It's possible Sungi Hun could have been too overwhelmed from the game, as he was so hyper-focused on getting Elam to play the game that he wouldn't really pay attention to any of his surroundings or what Elam was saying specifically. But the chances of this are just not likely. To continue their similarities, outside of the games, both Elam and Sungi Hun stole money from innocent, hardworking, underpaid people. In Sungi Hun's case, it was his mother, and in Elam's case, it was everyone else. Across the street from the Sky Building, there's a drunk man sitting on the sidewalk who appears to be homeless. Elam had been observing him for hours. Oh, by the way, I've been hearing theories that this place where the homeless man is resting on the street is the same place where Sungi Hun is picked up for the games. But this is just not true. It would have been really cool symbolically, but you can tell by stuff like the street signs and the stoplights that they are two different places. Anyway, instead of helping the homeless man sitting out in the cold, Elam just observes him. Then, Elam proposes a bet that if no one helps the homeless man by midnight, he wins. But if someone does help the homeless man before the clock strikes midnight, then Sungi Hun wins. If Sungi Hun wins, he gets to kill Elam. And if Elam wins, he gets to take everything from Sungi Hun, which is pretty vague, but fine. After he won Squid Game, Sungi Hun didn't touch the money, and was still living like he used to. This catches Elam's attention, as he must have seen the same thing happen with 132, also known as the Frontman, as the Frontman continued to live in an incredibly small apartment after winning the games. The first thing Elam asks Sungi Hun is if he feels guilty. This gives us some insight into how the Frontman must have felt 
result after winning the games, as the frontman and Elam had clearly been in contact after the competition ended. Now, like the frontman, Sung Hun comes back to the games even after winning the competition. There's a theme of religion and faith throughout the season. The piggy bank holding the prize money is lit with this golden yellow light to make it look like a holy object everyone worships. Elam is seen as a godlike figure towards the last half of the season, as he resides in a golden palace above everyone else in the facility. He's got stuff like omnipotence down, as he can observe every player in the games and keep track of them in the real world. This would make Sungi Hun the son of God in this metaphor. When talking about his son's birthday coming up soon, Elam asks Sungi Hun what day is it, the 24th? Then, in episode 9, Elam calls Sungi Hun to the Sky Building on December 24th, also known as Christmas Eve. In the Bible, after creating heaven and earth, it's written that on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and that God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Elam made it so Squid Game would be six games over six days. Then he brings Sungi Hun to the Sky Building, a clear representation of heaven. He specifically brings Sungi Hun to the seventh floor to play the seventh game. So technically, Elam rests on the seventh day. It's said multiple times that Elam had a son and a wife. Why they are not present in his current life is still unknown. But in the games that are a clear representation of the capitalist system we have in the real world, the players ruin their relationships with each other, trading their humanity for financial security. This is what must have happened to Elam in the real world. He must have ended up losing his relationship with his son and wife after sacrificing too much to get to the top, as he later claims that making money is not a simple thing to do. Like Sungi Hun, he lost everything from getting more money than he could ever need. Elam, wanting to feel one last thing before he died, was related to him feeling alive as a kid, but he also felt alive watching his son play with his friends, as he was very fond of those memories. He somehow lost that, but ended up feeling some of that life again through his connection with Sungi Hun. Sungi Hun served as a replacement for his son. Elam, still discouraged, is betting against humanity, as he has no faith in people, and tries to prove to Sungi Hun that humanity is bad, as this would be the nail in the coffin to show people's unwillingness to help each other, something that we witness throughout the games. With more money than he could ever need in his bank account, and feeling like he lost everything, Sungi Hun is brought down to the same level as the VIPs, as Elam convinces him to bet over a man's life. By midnight, somebody helps the homeless man, and Elam loses the bet, as his philosophy on people is proven wrong. Finally, Elam is playing fairly as he accepts his death. At the beginning of their conversation, Elam removes his oxygen mask. I am no doctor, but I'm assuming that this is what led to his timely death at midnight, as he was on the edge of death, and knew how much time he would have left without getting enough oxygen. When the clock strikes midnight, and it's Christmas Day. This moment is not the birth of Christ, but the rebirth of Sungi Hun, as Elam's seventh game restored his faith in humanity. So that was my quick, comprehensive guide to Elam, the host, or number one, whichever one you want to call him. If you guys like this video and love Squid Game, please let me know in the comments if you want to see more Squid Game videos just like this one, because at this point, I could easily make a video for every character in Squid Game, including the VIPs. But seriously, I'm having so much fun making these videos, and thank you guys so much for your support so far. I'm so glad I get to be talking about one of my favorite shows. As always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you in my next Squid Game video. Thank you.